Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. We are eight in number now, hoping that uh, others will be joining as we uh, step into a full session. We always uh, get people dialing up to 10 before we uh, launch the session, but hopefully this is a very interesting topic and uh, we are going to have a lot of uh, um, people joining us. So if you are joining for the first time, I see most of those who are joining are regulars, but uh, if you are joining for the first time, this is uh, Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. Uh, we meet every two weeks to discuss on the health issues that affect our country and to see how we can contribute to the improvement of the healthcare system in Cameroon. So today we shall be having a very interesting uh, guest speaker and a very interesting topic, which many people are passionate about, which is sickle cell. So I hope that uh, we are going to have a very beautiful weekend together. But before then, let's just uh, say hello to some regulars who are dialing in. Uh, Mono, how was your week? Uh, let me start with the chair. How was your week, Dr. Mono? It was great to yeah. see you once again in New York. <laughs> it was a pleasure meeting you, Alvis, in New York, and uh, thanks for the warm reception. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I've been spending the time flying around for weddings and uh, graduation, so that's how my weekend has been. But I'm very excited. You know, I'm very passionate about sickle cell. And uh, on the 17th, I think that's World Sickle Cell Day. That's why we decided not to. We've talked about sickle cell in the town hall multiple times, but I think it's a topic that we cannot uh, overemphasize. The last speaker was Dr. Yauba Seidu, who is who is here with us. And uh, I think we can never stop talking about sickle cell because it's a plight that has affected us as Africans. And uh, you had slaves in America for over 500 years, and it took us just the last century to actually identify the disease and actually talk about it and get to know the pathophysiology of the disease. Being a hematologist and an oncologist, the ASH American Association of Medical Hematology has made sickle cell a priority. Before that, sickle cell was not a priority. There were diseases that had less prevalence with more treatment than sickle cell. So the American Association of Hematology decided to make sickle cell a priority given, and this has led to a lot of advancements within the past 10 years since it became a priority. We have had developments of new drugs, which sadly are not available in Africa. Things like Bosalotor, things like Crisaluzumab, things like bone marrow transplanting, things like gene editing. So it's one of those diseases that is driving technology, but sadly in Africa, we cannot access. So we'll talk about it today, Elvis. And uh, it's always my plight for us to be able to get out of clinical aspects and talk about what people are doing in the community in order to help us fight this disease. Thank you, Elvis. Uh, thank you very much, Mana. And uh, we have our co-moderator, Dr. Brian, who, who just joined us. Hello, Brian. Yeah, hi, hi, Elvis. Um, uh, thanks. I'm just uh, recovering from a very long uh, conference. Uh, really great to be here. Looking forward to this uh, presentation. Uh, but but really, what's most intriguing to me is really the collaborative and and the, the community approach to sickle cell tackling sickle cell disease um, as a whole. So really thrilled to have um, Dr. Polo with us today. I'm really looking forward to her presentation. Yeah, thank you, Brian. We have had a presentation on sickle cell, and what is interesting is that each presenter always take a particular angle that is unique. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Yaba Seidu, the country director of uh, the, the uh, of uh, the Clinton Health Access Initiative in Cameroon, who is here with us. He once uh, was our guest speaker here and was talking about sickle cell elimination by uh, 2060. And uh, we he took an angle that was really interesting, just talking about the possibilities and the things that we could do to really eliminate this uh, this disease. And uh, today we are going to be looking at it beyond the walls of just <laughs> you know uh, the clinical practice and how we can deal with uh, the treat holistic approach for uh, uh, for uh, treating this disease. So it's going to be a very interesting session. Let's just also say hello to. Uh, Dr. Yaoba, who has joined us. Hello, Yaoba. I know tomorrow is a feast. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Yaoba? Yeah, th thanks, uh, 
Thanks, Elvis. When I saw the title of this conversation, of this talk, I said this is really like one of the things that I will not dare to miss. Uh, because under normal circumstances, I should be in the mock spring and preparing for, for tomorrow. But given the interest that I have in this topic, uh, I, I thought it would be nice to actually like sit and learn. And uh, as you said, I gave a talk on sickle cell. And uh, we are beginning to see some traction. Uh, very positive. I think uh, uh, two weeks ago, the the national coordinator of the Council of Imams in Cameroon uh, issued a communique uh, instructing all imams to mandatory check for the sickle cell status of uh, people before they wed them. So I think that is really like uh, an important uh, development coming from the sickle, uh, from the from the civil society. And if we see these sort of actions from other from other uh, people or uh, faith or denomination or even councils and uh, and so on, then it's kind of possible to actually like reduce the pool of uh, sickle cell children being uh, being born each year in Cameroon. And I think we we'll continue with this uh, sort of advocacy and uh, what I what I refer to as closing the tap. So I look forward to this presentation and. Uh, Thank you so much uh, to the presenter for all the efforts in putting up the. Wow, that that, that is that is a really an interesting uh, uh, a, a contribution there from the civil society. Um, we when we start having the imams adding their voice to the fight against sickle cell, then it's really an interesting uh, 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 civil cell, uh, civil society contribution. As I mentioned before, we shall be having a very interesting uh, guest speaker today. Before we hand over to our guest speaker to present, let's know uh, who is Dr. Math Sandrine Mpolo. Uh, she's an accomplished healthcare consulting professional and social entrepreneur and an esteemed leader in the medical sciences. With a robust track record in building strategic relationships and advancing patient outcomes, she has made significant contributions in the field of dermatology, healthcare business intelligence, and digital health uh, financing. As co-founder and executive director of uh, Naya Limited, Dr. Polo has been instrumental in shaping the startup's healthcare financing and medical uh, education initiative in West Africa, earning the 2020 Orange Social Entrepreneur and Women's Prize. Her work at the Naya Limited has provided innovative solutions for affordable healthcare access, notably through creation of a pioneering health financing application for low-income patients. Dr. Polo's expertise extends to her role as a medical science liaison at the Jensen's, where she has successfully built strong relationships with over 30 key opinion leaders in dermatology across Canada. Her strategic insights and leadership have been pivotal in, in, in the launch of a key therapeutic product, which we all know is always on CNN as Trimfire, enhancing Jensen's reputation, reputation as a scientific partner of choice. In addition to her professional achievements, Dr. Mpolo is a recognized thought leader and mentor, having received multiple awards from Johnson & Johnson, including the Shape and uh, Anchor Award of her exceptional contributions to medical science and business strategy. Her scholarly contributions include numerous publications in reputable journals and presentations at national and international uh, conferences. Talking about her academic background, Dr. Mpolo holds a PhD in cancer and cell biology from the University of Cincinnati and a master's degree in molecular biology from the University of Montreal. She is fluent in both English and French, as you discovered today, and is, her bilingual communication skills have further amplified her impact in global health community. With a deep knowledge and an innovative approach and unwavering dedication to improving healthcare outcomes, Dr. Matt is a distinguished guest speaker who today will be talking to us about the collaborative approach on sickle cell disease treatment. I hand over to Dr. Matt for her presentation and uh, I hope you all pay attention while she presents and you ask your question at the end of the presentation. Thank you and over to you, Dr. Matt, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Alves. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I think this is a great set way, uh, a follow up to the remark of Dr. Mono, which actually mentioned that uh, there are many, many therapeutics or treatment modalities, but which are out of which for African countries. And today the subject of my talk is really looking beyond the uh, clinical walls or looking beyond the therapeutic uh, basket that we have now 
uh, and what can we do to really manage the disease, at least in Africa. So some have said, uh, I'm trying to move my slide. I'm not sure if you can see it moving. Okay, great. So I think people have said that music is medicine. You may have recognized here a cover um, for, by the um, reggae artist Bob Marley. Some have said this music heals. I think the question today is how can a non-medicinal product like music can influence one's health? Today, we're gonna delve into that topic. We are going to explore how non-medicinal product or non-medicinal intervention can actually and empower one's health, particularly sickle cell patient outcomes. So the outline of my talk is the following. So I'm gonna start by covering the burden of the disease. And then I proceed by actually pitching to you that it's imperative to redefine care access beyond the clinic and with an emphasis on the power of community-based uh, organization in driving sickle cell outcomes. I will also cover the uh, some successful model of community um, initiative in the um, in in the in the whole person care uh, model, with some um, some knowledge share, some knowledge sharing on the pillars to scale those initiatives, and we will end with a call to action. Simply, how can we contribute to improve uh, sickle cell care management in our communities? So sickle cell disease is a worldwide disease. I think people all like to refer it as a black disease. I live in North America. I've heard that times and times again. But when you look at this map, you can see certainly there is a high prevalence of sickle cell disease in Africa. It is also prevalent in India and in the Saudi. But really, all continents are affected by this disease. And the global trend estimated that around 8 million people live with sickle cell disease. This was data um, from 2021. We don't have the latest data from 2023, uh, but that's the latest on, on this global trend. So a quarter of these uh, people live in sub-Saharan Africa. In Cameroon, the prevalence is about 0.3%, meaning that uh, over 5 thousand births are affected by sickle cell disease in our country. So sickle cell disease is among the top 12 leading close, uh, causes of um, uh, death among children uh, under the age of five. And I think, I don't know if you can see this heat map here showing that it only in uh, this, this affects mostly sub-Saharan countries. In Cameroon, you may ask where does sickle cell disease rank? It's still within the, um, the, the 12, um, the 11 to 12 to 15 leading causes of death among children. What is sickle cell disease? I think we heard a lot about it. In uh, 2008, the WHO actually declared June 19th as the uh, sickle cell awareness day. Uh, calling on all countries to actually make effort and organize uh, so that this disease is controlled. Uh, so sickle cell disease is a genetic disorder affecting blood cells, so the red blood cells. It's actually transmitted to the child by a carrier uh, father and a carrier mother. So it affects the, so it's a mutation affecting the adult um, hemoglobin, uh, the, uh, the adult uh, hemoglobin uh, B, uh, chain. And once that's happened, what is, um, what is occurring in absence of oxygen, the hemoglobin S, which is the mutated uh, adult beta chain in sickle cell disease, is actually polymerizes, causing the red blood cells to change shape which is known as the crescent shape that we see in sickle cell patient, those red blood cells are very fragile. So they're prone to hemolysis to break. And when they do, they cause all kinds of uh, disorder in the vasculature. So we have um, 
so things like uh, baseline inflammation all the time, which actually causes uh, damage to the tissue. But the whole mark of the disease is really vaso occlusion, uh, which is basically the trapping of those um, crescent-shaped red blood cells into the blood vessels. And that's what causes pain, also known as vasoocclusive crisis. So beyond the whole mark, there is a whole host of, um, of uh, complications. I've just put uh, them here. I'm not going to list them. But I just want to mention that sickle cell disease is not just a red blood cell disorder. It's actually a systemic disorder. And one, uh, when we think about a systemic disease, one should also think about treating beyond the red blood cell, treating the individual as a whole. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So there's been many uh, advances in the um, therapeutic modality for sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease was actually the first molecular disease described in 1910. Uh, and uh, up to date, there have been, um, there have been many, um, many therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Mono mentioned about Vosselator uh, and Crizalizumab, which are the newest uh, medication around, but not available in Africa. And quite frankly, uh, not available. Some of them for the Crizalizumab is not even available in Europe. We we'll talk about the target of those molecules, but I just want to uh, bring your attention to the fact that there has been many advances in the therapeutic modality. However, what we see is, is an increased burden of sickle cell disease, despite all those treatments available in the West. And this increase is not just in Africa, it's also seen in the US. If you look at the number here, globally, there's been an increase of 13 uh, close to 14% in the global total sickle cell disease births. What is even worrisome is that despite all the therapies available in the US, where those therapies are available, there's still a 20 year uh, gap in life expectancy in adults affected with sickle cell disease. So these numbers are great for the pharmaceutical market because they are actually driving the growth. Of, uh, the, of, of the the market share of these uh, molecules. I'm not gonna comment on that, but I just want for you to think about this. We have the medications available, if we think about the West or the US in this instance, but the burden in this country, it's increasing. So my question to you is, is the affordability the issue behind this burden? But before we answer that, I just wanted to review with you how we think, how the health system think about managing sickle cell disease. What you see here is actually a description of what most societies or most guidelines actually recommend in terms of managing sickle cell disease. What you may have noticed is that is heavily clinically driven. We talk about sickle cell disease being a systemic disease. And what we're seeing here is targeted therapy towards the red blood cells or the vasculature. It's not, there is no systemic therapy to the exception of the curative approach, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But let's focus on the symptom management and prevention um, quadrant for a moment. What you see here uh, is that the therapies available actually target one segment of the disease. For example, Vexolato that Mo Dr. Mono mentioned target the sickling. And the others target various aspects of, um, of the vasculature. I'm not gonna name them, they also target pain, but there is no comprehensive targeting, at least with the new the latest therapeutics, to the exception, as I said, the creative approach, targeting the whole uh, systemic uh, complications of sickle cell disease. So this is how our health system approach sickle cell. Symptom management, complication prevention, prevention of complications. Now we have new therapy, uh, the therapies available, which are the gene, the, the cells-based gene therapy approach. I'm going to briefly mention them, uh, that they are only available in the US, they've been recently approved as of November last year. And as of today, there only been one 
patient treated with this mo that modality. So the cell-based gene therapies actually involve uh, taking one person a stem cell, so the, 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 the sick uh, progenitor cells, and replacing by gene editing and, and adding by gene editing a new genes. If we talk about the uh, gene editing uh, with Cascavi, for example, this is actually involving silencing the inhibition of uh, the fetal hemoglobin. I mentioned in the beginning that the sickle cell disease is actually a mutation involving the adult chain of the hemoglobin. So when we are born, we have we actually have a different hemoglobin being expressed called the fetal hemoglobin. So the gene editing approach is actually looking at reactivating the fetal hemoglobin by silencing the inhibitor of the fetal hemoglobin. That's what this is about. This is done using uh, gene editing. And the second one, uh, the Lifgenia uh, gene therapy is simply adding a normal adult hemoglobin to the, um, the, the affected uh, stem cells to, so that yeah, the, 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 there's an increased production of the normal hemoglobin. So this slide is really not about discussing the therapy, but really to show you how as a whole, the health system thinks about managing sickle cell disease, making more therapeutics, uh, target therapies, more and more, the previous slide showed that this actually doesn't reduce the burden. And this is also true at the policy level. Someone mentioned that the, um, the civil society, the Imam in Cameroon has actually uh, requested for sickle cell training before uh, weddings. Uh, this is also an approach that we've seen in Saudi Arabia in 2023. There has been a royal decree to have fam family counseling, but in practice, this is rarely done. And India just announced that they also gonna have a premarital, premarital counseling prior weddings. This was announced last year. So with that, I'm asking you, is this increased burden that we've seen due to challenge in accessing therapy for sickle cell disease? If you look at this slide, one might be tempted to say yes. On the left of this um, uh, slide, what you can see is that as uh, the new therapeutics or the new medication to manage sickle cell disease uh, became available in the US in the 90s, we also show an increase in life expectancy. That's what the, uh, the, the graph in the, in the, in, on the left shows. And the one of, on, the, uh, on the right, at least my right, shows that indeed the latest therapy, Voxelator, Crisalizumab, uh, has indeed added 10 more years in terms of life expectancy in adults living with sickle cell disease in the US. So if you see this, we can say yes, when this therapy becomes available, they indeed increase the life expectancy and perhaps also the quality of life of those individuals. But I want you to pay close attention to this graph. This is old data. What you are seeing here on the left, again, is the survival curve of newborns in Jamaica, in Dallas, in the United States, Jamaica, in the Caribbean, in Dallas, these are longitudinal cohorts of patients who have been screened as babies in those regions and have been followed over time before the standard of care adroxyria became available. What you see in the Jamaican cohort 1973, 1975, the purple line here, you see a dramatic, uh, dramatic increase in mortality. So the survival is less. If you compare that to the blue line, which is actually still Jamaican babies, but now the cohort is being followed from 1971 to 1981, you see that the survival is increased. The mortality is reduced. Why is that? This was before we have aldoxeria available. Uh, this was before we even have, in Jamaica at least, 
the vaccination for the pneumococcal vac uh, vaccines available. And I'm gonna go even further when we look at the Dallas cohort, which is the green here uh, line, which is basically the cohort of children we've been, who have been screened uh, at birth in, in the region of Dallas, Texas. And what they've done there is actually to follow those patients up to 18 years of age. So this again is before the introduction of hydroxyurea. So I hope you can appreciate that even before this, the introduction of standard of care, there has been something happening to increase survival of patients with sickle cell disease, which was not a therapeutic, not a medication, at least how we think about medication, something which targets an element involving the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease. So here is the kick. I try to summarize the findings of those cohort in those cohorts in in three, um, three segments. What you see at the top here is basically the intervention those teams have done. They didn't have hydroxyria, and for the Jamaican cohort, they didn't even have access to vaccination against uh, um, the, um, the access to the pneumococcal vaccine because this was too expensive for uh, Jamaican parents. So if you look at the diagram on the left, once again, the purple one, this was before any counseling was done with parents. Once the counseling is introduced, what you see here is there is a reduction in the mortality in this kid by 71%. If you make the calculation here. So in, essentially what the Jamaican um, care team have, has done is to counsel, to do parental counseling Parent, uh, parental education. So they enable parents to recognize signs which need immediate healthcare uh, attention, medical attention in the children. So splenic sequestration was among those signs. And just with this intervention, you can see there has been a dramatic reduction in mortality in, in those children. And later on, they introduced actually the vaccination. And again, that reduces the mortality. So this is not medicinal intervention per se. Although here we can see they've also introduced prophylaxis. Now to the right, what has been done in the US with the Dallas cohort, it's three things which I've tried to highlight. Again, the educational component, educating the parents, around uh, on the recognition of spinning sequestration, the sign requiring medical attention, that they went even beyond that. What they did is they looked at the patient as a whole. If the patient was missing its appointment, they will first follow up with a call, then they will reschedule the appointment, the medical appointment, and next they will send a social worker to inquire what is going on in the patient's life, his parents' life, which precluded him to come into the clinic. And lastly, if the patient was not responding of his parents, his family, they will send a mail notification highlighting the need to seek um, a medical care. Again, there was no hydroxyurea. However, in the Dallas cohort, they did use prophylaxis. So penicillin was introduced earlier. They also recommended early first medical visits. So instead of starting seeing the patient at one year of age, the average uh, age at which the patient was seeing, it's 60 days. So basically three months. So I hope you can appreciate from this experience done in the 70s and the, in the 80s that there is a lot that can be done even if we don't have uh, the standard of care or the latest uh, gimmick in terms of uh, therapy, uh, targeting therapies. So the educational component is important. Taking into account the social determinant of health, it's important. And lastly, the care optimization in the sense that patient needs to be screened early and then managed early with 
early introduction of antibiotics for prophylaxis, early uh, vaccination as well. So this experience shows us that managing the social determinants of health is actually very important, if not as important of having a target uh, treatment. So I want us to pause for a moment and revisit what are the social determinants of health. Uh, WHO defined five uh, areas. We have the economic stability, the healthcare access quality, education access, social cohesion, and neighborhood, uh, how well your neighborhood is enable you to actually thrive. So I'm not gonna go through all the details of this slide, just to tell you that there has been evidence in the literature that the social determinant of health, at least in sickle cell disease, influence health outcome. For example, family with low uh, income experience an increase in emergency uh, department visit for acute pain. And this is mostly done in the US. I think there needs to be some research done in our own backyard in Africa. That's why I put the graph to the, uh, on the left, which is basically a, a multivariant analysis of the social determinant of health on the mortality in children uh, under the age of 15 in five countries in Africa. So the way to read this plot is the more the, 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 the black dot moves towards the, the right, uh, there's an increase in mortality, and the more they, they move toward the left, there is a decrease. So basically what they've shown in this African um, cohort is that uh, you can see the mother's age is actually associated with an increase in mortality among those children. Second thing, the mother education. If the mother has a low education or no schooling, this is also increased. This is was also seen in the US cohort. If you just look at the graph on the, 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 the information on the left, you can see also that education actually low education or low health literacy increases the visit at the ER. And also in Nigeria, it's associated with severe anemia. Lastly, the, 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 the social economic status of both African families and US-based families influences dramatically the survival rate of these children. You can see that in the, um, survival analysis here in Africa, and also what I mentioned earlier, that patient with uh, uh, living in low-income family actually have uh, more, more, um, more odds actually to, to, to suffer for acute pain and ended up uh, at the ER. So this is really important in our discussion today to remember that the social determinant of health are actually influencing the health outcomes of patients in sickle cell disease. This is going beyond the clinic. This is actually the beyond the clinic part of my talk. So, but the question might be how and why now? Why should we actually look at redefining how we care for those patients? I think I've already explained why, but I, if I wanted really to drive this point home, we cannot afford the current therapies. Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest burden of um, sickle cell disease mortality. So the sickle cell disease mortality rate is high in Sub-Saharan Africa. Even basic standard care, which is adoxyurea, uh, it's out, very out of reach, very much out of reach for patient, uh, African patients. This is a study that was done uh, last year, I believe, in Cameroon as well. So you have here about six countries where they basically show the average cost in US dollar of hydroxyurea if a patient takes 1,000 milligram per day is 25 uh, US dollar. And if you look at uh, uh, Cameroon, for example, when a third of the uh, population lives below the poverty line, this is basically out of reach for most families. So as a, as a reference point, I put down here 
the cost of the other medication we talked about, the newest medication, crisalizumab, uh, the bone marrow transplant, which is a curative approach, all the cell-based gene therapy. We talked about therapy costing millions for the cell-based um, gene therapy approach and hundred thousands for the bone marrow or the crisalizumab uh, uh, therapy. So what you can see here, it's an imperative for us to redefine how we approach access to care for sickle cell disease patients in Africa. So I think, I hope I succeed to actually uh, convince you that sickle cell disease is a systemic disease. It is also a disease which is very much affected by things happening beyond the clinic so the social determinant of health. So to tackle that, we, we need to actually uh, look beyond the clinic. And one way to do that is to redefine what we call therapy. I want to propose here uh, what has been already talked about in the literature. Uh, this is not me actually coming up with a new idea, but this is something that I think can be applied uh, to sickle cell disease to look beyond the therapy focused lens when it comes to caring for sickle cell disease patient and approach it as a whole person care system. The whole person care system addresses the social determinant of health. It talks about, it addresses the biologic, the behavioral, the social and environmental aspect of the patient. Now you might say a doctor doesn't have the time in his medical practice to cover all of this. That is why the title of this slide says, it takes a village. It takes a village. It takes the doctor, it takes the patient, it takes his family, it takes the community and the population as a whole. That is why I would like to propose here to look at this concept of caring for sickle cell disease patient to the lens of whole person care supported by community linkages. So the whole person care, as I said, addresses many barriers to care in, uh, faced by sickle cell disease patient. And these barriers are actually associated as we just saw to social determinant of, he of, of health. And the community, I think, and you will see in a minute an example I'll share, have found a way to actually fill that gap in terms of caring for the person as a whole. So I'm going to now um, share some examples of community-based uh, initiative around this concept of whole person care in sickle cell disease uh, patients. This is an, a patient association uh, in Cameroon called um, APED. In French, it's Association des Parents des Enfants de Panocytaires. They have this approach of using WhatsApp as a support group and also community activity to educate the patient. APED was founded in 20, uh, 2005, I believe, in Yaoundé. It has over 3,000 uh, members. It's affiliated to Fondation Chantal Biard Mothers and Child's um, Center. And I think what is really uh, characteristic of APED is the way they function. I mentioned already the offline and online uh, outreach, but it's the care navigation approach they took to this care. And you'll see in, the, in a minute what they do. And this care navigation approach enables them to support also financially the members. They actually have what they call a mutual saving fund to support parents when there is a, um, a, a, a vasoclusive crisis. And I'm gonna tell you how, what they do, but this slide is a bit busy, so I need to actually guide you a little bit. So I mentioned APED has succeeded in establishing a community care management approach in sickle cell disease patient in Yaoundé. They are just caring for patients in the Yaoundé region in Cameroon. So they, what they do is basically they address the social determinant of health and the known barrier among the social determinant of health, which are known to be barrier to care for sickle cell disease patient. I listed here what the social determinant of health could be and the barrier which have been cited in the literature 
uh, to be barriers to care for sickle cell disease patients. I'm not going to read them, but uh, I guess you can read for yourself. But what I'm going to share with you is the approach at, at APET took uh, to tackle environmental barriers. What they basically put together is a peer to peer parent talks group, which is on WhatsApp. So they leverage social media. And this is actually enable patients to share how they can actually address structural barrier to care, one being the provider's attitude. In Cameroon, it's very much a problem when patients go and seek for care. Sometimes the provider is not willing because they think it takes time. So they share how to actually manage the providers in these groups. I think this is very interesting. And the, the other thing that they do to basically tackle the, the um, issue of access to care, and this is under the biological segment when we think about the barriers, it's actually putting in place what I call a, a partnership with care providers. So the, provi the providers actually share evidence-based health information. It's on the forum of WhatsApp. And they also liaise with a pharmacy to arrange what a, a group procurement of the prophylaxis that the patient needs. I'm not going to go uh, in details uh, about what the APED does, but just to tell you that in the community already, they found a solution to their own problem. So they tackle all this area in the support uh, group. And the impact of it is treatment adherence, increased uh, quality of life, and resilience. Resilience has been shown in the literature to be actually associated with less visit in the ER at least in the US. So this is very hard to read, but I just wanted to, to also share that beyond Cameroon, in other countries in Africa, there are beautiful things that are coming from the community. Here is actually an initiative uh, actually uh, led by the School of Pharmacy in Tanzania. And what they've decided to do is to address the structural barrier to care. As you know, there is no policy in most African countries around uh, affordability of the standard of care at Oxyria. So what they did is basically um, look into addressing this barrier by preparing the Galenic formulation of Oxyria. So it's not available in Tanzania. So they basically recruited a bunch of pharmacy students. Of course, they go to the approval um, framework at the Ministry of Health to basically prepare compound formulation of adroxyria. And they were able to show that these were efficacious in patients. They increased the uh, hemoglobin levels and they actually were much cheaper, I think 11 times cheaper from the commercially available um, adroxyria in, in a commercial private pharmacy. This is another example and it's from our own backyard. So in, uh, what I want to emphasize is community-based organization, uh, community serving patients, but also community serving the caregivers taking care of those patients. This is an example of how we can actually use technology to enable accountable health community models. What I mean by that is actually supporting the caregiver Taking, which would take care of the sickle cell patient. In this example, we actually show that health transfer from the migrants or for the close relative, from the close relative of a of sickle cell patient can actually support adherence to treatment because this health, those health transfer are linked to providers. So the patient does not have to worry about his social economic status anymore in terms of accessing his care. And the beauty of this type of system is the connection of the health transfer to outcomes, because there is a, a mandate of sharing the outcomes with the caregivers. So it's basically a platform allowing also for reporting. And what that does, it supports adherence. And we know that when 
uh, the economic status of patient is raised, this decreases, at least in the US, the chance to, uh, to, to visit the uh, emergency uh, room. So this is a, a, another example like uh, where basically the, the society, the, the American Society of Hematology decided to address the deficit of knowledge among care provider in the US, of course, but we've seen that also in Cameroon, uh, about 80% of care providers, family physician in the US report that they feel uncomfortable uh, treating people with sickle cell disease. 70% of them believe that more education and support tools will help avoid complication in managing sickle cell disease. I just wanted to mention that this is very important. Physicians are saying they're not equipped to care for those patients. And I don't have the data here, but I can tell you there's data that's just got published showing that in the US, the mortality rate among children's patient, uh, sickle cell disease uh, patients, uh, which are younger, is completely eliminated. However, we see a surge in mortality during the transition of care. And I, wanted, I wonder if this is not related to the physician not being comfortable treating those patients. So that's why I wanted to share this uh, initiative by the American Society of Hematology. What they basically decide is to put the knowledge in the hands of the physician using the, digi uh, the, the, the digital technology. So making the uh, guideline recommendation available to podcast, to app, and also, I think uh, on, uh, also they also have a format where physicians can ask questions online on the web, uh, website platform. So this addresses this aspect of clinician not knowing how to care for this patient. It potentially can reduce, uh, can increase the life expectancy when these patients are well taken care of in the US setting. I finish with this example of uh, what has been done here in Quebec. Uh, uh, where I, I'm currently based. Again, it's the same approach as the, um, uh, the, the APET, the uh, uh, patient association based in Yaoundé. They decided to address the social determinant of health as well as the known barriers to care access among sickle cell disease patients. And they do it by very simple uh, methodologies. One is to have a culturally adapted care linkage uh, with uh, the healthcare system. They basically use ethnic nurse to go and talk to community to incentivize them to participate in blood drive because it's very difficult sometimes for some sickle cell patient to get uh, much blood when they need transfusion. So the community has actually managed also to make sure new migrants don't fall off in the care, uh, in uh, the screening uh, system they basically managed to have partnership with dedicated provider to make sure that newcomers to Canada get screened when they come from those um, uh, regions with high burden of diseases. And I want to also highlight that they actually went beyond the traditional management of pain with, by offering to children massage therapy, which by the way is now recommended by the American Society of Hematology to manage pain in uh, among sickle cell uh, uh, patients. And lastly, uh, what they've done beautifully is really trying to influence the behavior of both the clinician, but also the patient. As I mentioned, this, there is a knowledge deficit among patient and clinician. And if you remember in one of my slides, the knowledge deficit among patient or the low health literacy among patient is actually associated to visit in the ER and acute um, pain. Uh, complain. So this association is actually hosting every year conferences with experts on sickle cell disease to share evidence-based care management guidelines. And I think uh, you can see the impact they have uh, in uh, there on uh, sickle cell disease patients. So I have two slides left. Uh, I just wanted to finish with this. What do we need to actually push this concept of caring beyond the clinical walls? I want to basically pose this to you. 
can we actually push evidence-based whole person care for sickle cell disease management in Africa, knowing that we cannot afford, we have the highest burden of diseases. So I think to do that, uh, there are four pillars that we need to consider. The first one, we need to understand what those determinants of health are in the African context. So we need to convene, we need to regroup, we need to look at what has been done in other regions, because most of the data is coming from the US, so it's really important to regroup and look at what is important for us when we think about the social determinant of health affecting sickle cell disease outcomes. The second thing I want to uh, propose is also data integration. As you see, coordinating whole person care takes a lot of actors, a lot. You have the, the providers, you have the community, you have the patient, you have his family. So it's important to have a system to document tested intervention linking sickle cell disease outcome and health system integration. The third pillar is around collaboration. It's very important to share best practice knowledge, which is what the American Society of Hematology is doing beautifully. I think there is a need for training to raise awareness, to inform policy, even if we don't have the framework established yet in Africa. It's really important to collaborate and share this knowledge. The last piece is accountability. If we build a whole person care system, even through community-based uh, organization, we need accountabilities to show that indeed these interventions have an impact on sickle cell disease, health outcome, mortality, survival, visit to the ER. And one way to do that is to really demand when we engage with those community-based organization, report outcomes. We need to also educate them around uh, impact measurements. We need to educate them around program participation uh, and also advocates uh, for standardized organizational protocols because oftentimes they do things here and there, but they're not very organized and they cannot really go back and see what has worked, what has not worked. I think accountability has to take place. And of course, uh, what is very important to support this pillar is to have the infrastructure for data sharing. So the IT infrastructure, the funding, there needs to be funding to finance incentives to promote whole person care in sickle cell disease patient. There's also a need for qualified human resources for care coordination. We talk about the community-based organization. They do it because they have been affected by sickle cell disease or they have a close relative, but they are not qualified in terms of care coordination. So there needs to be some sort of um, capacity building to be, to be put in place if we have to leverage this organization to move uh, forward this the whole patient and the whole person care for sickle cell disease. So you may ask, what can you do in your own community? So I said, we need to convene. So there are many panels, at least in the US and in Canada right now, that uh, in, we were in, uh, inviting people from the civil society to basically share your idea what the whole person, uh, whole person care should be in the context of sickle cell disease. The American Society of Hematology just closed a call for nomination for people from the civil society to come and share what should we do in terms of managing this patient. I think it was closed on June 10th. But I, I, I bet there will be many more like, 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 like that. The other thing that you can do to convene is to find out about community-based organization operating a whole person care for sickle cell disease. Educate yourself on social determinant of health and sickle cell disease outcomes. Around the integration, if you are a skill expert in IT, volunteer your skills. Contact those organizations and see how they can actually organize uh, digitally the organization, finance the community-based organization 
supporting this, uh, the whole person care model. And again, something that we can do easily is to share, 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 share the evidence. We have social media. The patient organization is doing that beautifully on WhatsApp, advocating your family, champion if you are a healthcare provider, champion the whole person uh, care approach in your practice setting. Or start a venture, we've seen that in Tanzania, they show that galenic, galenic Galenetic formulation of hydroxyria is feasible and is accepted by patient. So they show us the way. If you are an entrepreneur, I would encourage you to look at that paper um, and I can share the, the, the reference. They've actually done a cost analysis. So uh, please look at it if you are interested in this type of venture and accountability. When we send uh, remittance to our parents. We need to demand accountability on outcomes. We need to demand it. I know these are difficult conversations, but we need to demand it. Uh, some organization in Cameroon, uh, including patient organization, have already started organi organizing themselves to offer transparency over the funds that are being sent to them. So this is very important. Uh, and of course, yeah. uh, if you have, again, skills in terms of um, organizing care coordination, this is also an area where you can be involved in your community. So in summary, we talk about the burden, the global burden of sickle cell disease. Uh, we actually um, emphasize the importance to redefine access to a holistic approach with community engagement. We also talk about the potential to leverage those community and empower them to the whole person care approach. Uh, I discussed some real world example of community uh, successfully implementing this whole person care approach uh, in, uh, on impacting the um, sickle cell uh, disease health outcomes. And lastly, uh, I presented present. to you some ways by which we can act, we can contribute in our own community uh, to this concept of caring for the person and not caring for a system or an organs or a cell type. So I hope you find it useful and I thank you for your attention. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Matt Sandrine, for this excellent presentation. Care, not caring for cells, not type, or not caring for uh, the health system, but caring for a person, the person, the whole person care approach. What a resounding message on a very important topic like uh, the one we have today. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are joining for the first time, this is the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. We meet every two weeks to have this kind of conversation on important topic affecting the healthcare system of Cameroon. And our guest today uh, is Dr. Matt Sandrine Mpolo. Thank you for this excellent presentation. While you stop sharing your screen, I'm going to take a round uh, uh, to get comments from the co-moderators uh, before we open uh, the segment for question and answer while we give you time to sip a glass of water. Hi, uh, let me start with Brian. Hello, Dr. Brian. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Elvis. I, I think that it was a really excellent presentation. I, I really loved uh, that she took us back to the social determinants of health and, and particularly the context, uh, the application or the implementation of social determinants of health in uh, in the African context. That was really, uh, really, really powerful. I was really thrilled to hear about the um, the the uh, the APET uh, foundation as well and how they are using different uh, uh, I think WhatsApp social support groups to help connect providers in order to uh, to provide care to uh, to these people. So I think this was really a very resounding um, uh, presentation um, and uh, learned a lot. I learned a lot about the the challenges of uh, of sickle cell and why it remains a, a, a key. Uh, problem in in our African context. So, really, uh, congratulations to uh, um to to Dr. Polo for this really great and brilliant presentation. Looking forward to the Q and A. Yeah, so thank you, Brian. Um, quite really interesting when she took us to some of the basic things that uh you won't imagine. Even if uh, hydroxyurea is absent in Cameroon, that does not stop you from giving a sickle cell child a massage, something as basic as that. 
very interesting presentation as we're going to get uh, all the little uh, bits and pieces of the important thing that we have to do to that we can do to offer the whole person care approach. And but let me get to some members of the town hall to get their comments before I land on our chair, mm -hmm. who certainly has a lot to say. Um, I see Dr. Martin Ekiti, uh, who has joined us today from Canada. Hello, Martin. Hi, Elvis. Good it's been uh, it's been a very long time. I am glad that I chose this particular session to um, to to come back on board um, because it it reminds me of pretty much all that I'm most passionate about when it comes to healthcare. I have said it so many times to everyone who has cared to listen that we cannot afford healthcare. No country in the world can afford healthcare. If the US cannot afford healthcare, if the countries of the G7 cannot afford healthcare, Sub-Saharan Africa should not even be thinking about affording healthcare. So some of the therapeutics that um, Sanjun was talking about, are they're nice to know, you know, for us, but they're, that's all they are. That's all they really realistically can be nice to know. The, our only hope is to include everybody to get back on this healthcare train that, you know, mentioning, leveraging some of the things that she mentioned, which is holistic care. Holistic care uh, uh, is the only way that we can actually hope to achieve something uh, of value in sub Saharan Africa. Sickle cell has such a high burden. And I'm really, like I said, I'm really glad that I, I got to listen to some of the incredible things that um, some some organizations have done with very basic tools. You know, WhatsApp is free. We use it for all manner of things, but to, to actually hear that people are leveraging something as simple as WhatsApp to improve the care of these children. I have cared for sickle cell children in my in, in my practice, you know, before living in the country. And I it was extremely painful to watch them go through the things that they went through and to see that in some of the studies that she mentioned, they were able to increase life expectancy by 10 years by doing very simple things it gives us a lot of hope. And I'm really hoping that we can um, leverage some of the things that she mentioned have worked in other parts of the world and make it a reality in Cameroon so that um, um, we, we, we see these effects as well in our population. So thank you, Dr. Max Andrin. It's been a wonderful presentation. I look forward to the Q&A as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin. And for those who don't know him, he's been a guest speaker on the Cameroon Town Hall for healthcare professionals when he was still the medical doctor at Sonora in Cameroon. And uh, his topic was on occupational health. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on set, uh, Dr. Martin. And obviously, you would remember when a sickle cell patient come in front of you, certainly all you see, as Ma uh, Math mentioned, is the sickle cell, the cell type and the condition. But maybe little do we think about you know, the social environment and uh, the neighborhood where the child is coming from, the parents, the socioeconomic situation of the parents, which forms all the burden that the child brings into the healthcare system. And so that is just some of the things uh, uh, Matt has uh, uh, has really taken time to explain to us today. Let me get some other comments. I see uh, certainly Stan Polo attended this session. Some comments from you, if you don't mind. Okay, we can get Stain, follow. Maybe I get to Eugene. Eugenie? Eugenie Mempo, any comments about the topic? I'm just calling people randomly before I hand over to the board, to our chair, Dr. Mono, for his comments. If we can get Eugenie, I'll get, mm -hmm. I'll get back to Dr. Yaoba Seido. Certainly, Dr. Yaoba, last time you presented, you, you mm -hmm. mentioned about eliminating uh, sickle cell by 2060. Looking at all what uh, Matt Sandrine has presented, uh, would like to hear how this adds to your vision on sickle cell elimination. Okay, Dr. Yaoba Seido. Hi, uh, yeah, th th thank you very much, uh, Elvis. Thanks a lot about Matt for that excellent presentation. Very insightful, we did learn a lot of things. Um, Elvis, I think coming back to your question, I think uh, one of the core things that we actually like um, uh, will need to do, and I think uh, Matt actually touched on that, uh, the determinants of health and uh, the role of civil society. So for me, I think I see like basically uh, two, two major pathways. 
So the first one is really like what I said before, closing the gap. How do we decrease the pool, the pool of uh, sickle cell uh, children being born? And uh, that essentially can be done through uh, premarital uh, counseling and um, civil society has a very big role to play. And I think the services also will need to be available, uh, including uh, medical products uh, that uh, could be used by uh, community health care workers or civil society to ensure that the screening is done. And a lot of sensitization would also need to happen. And then once that is done, I think uh, one, so for those uh, the, um, couples that are missed at that point, we really need to emphasize on uh, the newborn screening. I think uh, a lot a lot is uh, a lot uh, um, has been done on newborn screening and is currently ongoing in a lot of uh, African countries and also in the developing uh, in in other developing nations through the Pen Plus initiative. So when you pick up a child very early, you can follow that child. Um, you can follow that child and that child, uh, and if the resources are available, that child can live a healthy and normal life. So in that, uh, from that perspective, those health inputs will need to be available. And, and that essentially involves uh, putting in place the necessary regulations and ensuring that the supply chain uh, for all the different products are working and so on. Um, the supply chain product uh, uh, is working and the funding is also available, be it from the state, from the civil society, and so on. And more importantly, I think uh, pharmaceutical companies will have a very big role to play because, uh, uh, as uh, Matt mentioned, the major uh, barrier is that most of the products that we need to uh, treat sickle cell, particularly uh, in Africa and Cameroon, uh, simple things like uh, uh, hydroxyurea and all, also things like uh, blood products, they are hardly available. So we really need to figure out how we can incentivize uh, manufacturers. And I think Matt had, uh, talked about this, uh, to get these products to the patients uh, who, who, uh, who need them. And again, I think uh, we cannot under, uh, uh, re re overstate uh, um, or underestimate the role uh, of putting up uh, robust data collection systems uh, that will enable us to uh, capture data on the, the different uh, pillars of uh, of uh, service delivery uh, so as to make informed decisions. So it's a continuous battle, but I am glad that uh, we are beginning to see a lot of momentum uh, from uh, a number of people, uh, organizations, and uh, uh, civil societies, and also governments uh, to tackle this disease. So this the political will is there. I think we just need to keep on pushing, uh, pushing, and pushing, and doing the advocacy and I think uh, hopefully uh, if we keep on the momentum or the traction we should be able to uh, move the needle forward as far as uh, sickle cell um, uh, care uh, or con prevention control uh, and care uh, is concerned. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yaban. Thank you for the wonderful work you are doing to mobilize the civil society towards this. The imam in Cameroon have uh, set a very good example. I imagine a situation where the moderator of the PCC can talk about this, where the bishops in the Catholic Church can talk about it, where the Baptist uh, faithfuls can talk about this and just mobilize the society to think about the importance of just premarital screening uh, for, uh, for for this uh, sickle cell disease. And uh, we 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 have mm -hmm. uh, one of our co-moderators here. And also to emphasize, sickle cell is a very important topic to the town hall, as Muno always uh, mentioned. I think this is the third or the fourth presentation we are having on sickle cell uh, 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 when we consider that this is the 103rd session of the town hall we are having, to have one topic come up three times just tells you how important the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professional uh, is, uh, is placing on this uh, on this uh, disease. So I would want to call one of our co-moderators, Dr. Kate, uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to hear his comments. Dr. Kate, over to you. Hello, Elvis. Hello, everyone. Um, apologies for joining late. Uh, some of you may know the reason. Um, I was joining today to listen primarily uh, rather than to speak. I missed a huge chunk of um, the presentation, unfortunately. Um, um, and hearing Dr. Yaoba's comment, uh, one really cannot overemphasize the importance of this disease uh, to the town hall to uh, our nation, Cameroon, 
um, and Africa as a whole, since we know that um, people of African ethnicity would usually hold um, the greatest burden of this uh, sickle cell disease. And sickle cell disease, as we know, um, up, or seems to appear with some other uh, combination of you know other other pathologies that do uh, touch uh, people who have this disease that should be taken care of, and um, most of the complications of this disease would usually appear as um, um, non communicable forms of burdens of uh, of morbidity um, in the society, which obviously lay a huge uh, charge, economically speaking, to a health system. So the ramifications of sickle cell are huge um, from the familial standpoint, which some of you have mentioned, I've just mentioned the economic cost, but also uh, just the sheer um, burden on the family of those uh, who, have, uh, who have the disease. Now speaking from um, you mentioned um, religious leaders, um, I know many people uh, or in many communities, or at least in my Christian community, it's become a huge issue where the pastors are heavily informed now and trying to check whether you know couples coming together uh, have done this screening, and it's become um, um, one of I would say best practice at least in my uh, Christian community, which is a good thing. Now as to where the couples agree when there is discrepancies and the complications and ramifications around that, it's still an issue uh, to be sorted. But I think it's uh, a discussion that should be on the public space and that we should encourage such discussions to to hold and, um, clear and, and really pave out a clear pathway for on how to eliminate this disease because I think it's possible to eliminate it. Thank you, Elvis. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kate. It's always a pleasure to have you. Um, we are always very thrilled each time we have our own uh, elder, mentor, senior uh, uh, in, the, in, in the house, uh, Professor Forby, who is with us here today. And uh, we're always very thrilled that you are a fervent uh, participant of the town hall. I'm sure you might have some words or two as far as this the topic of sickle cell is concerned. Over to you, Professor Forby. So Professor Forby Matthias uh, is with us in the house. I'm passing over the mic to you for your comments on this topic. If you are speaking, you're on mute. Certainly we certainly we shall get uh, back to Professor Forby. He's always uh, with us in the house and uh, we're always uh, thrilled when we get his insight on each of the topics uh, after our presentation. So let me hand over now to our chair, Dr. Muno. I know you have just quite uh, some great insights to, to give us as far as this topic is concerned. Well, Elvis, I'm so blessed to have participated in this discussion today. And uh, I think Dr. Polo took us through the basics of what healthcare really has to be. And uh, considering the determinants of health is very important in every disease, sickle cell not, in, not excluded. So we could see the impact of other interventions that are not purely medical, you know, these things get to humble us as physicians. I take care of sickle cell patients here in the U.S. I'm a hematologist, an oncologist, but you get to see that it takes a village in order to really drive care. As I always say, WHO has shown us that the things we do as physicians in the hospitals have literally moved mortality very little in most diseases, even in cancer care. The things that are really important hygiene and sanitation, vaccination, introduction of the antibiotics, and every other thing that we do, this also plays into the context of sickle cell. So this goes in uh, light with hope through progress advancing sickle cell disease globally. That's the theme for the year. And uh, there was no other time when Dr. Polo told me she's interested in this than talking about sickle cell 
before the World Sickle Cell Day, which we have on Wednesday. And I think everyone should be an advocate for this disease. It's not only an African problem, it's also found in every place where you have had malaria. It's a gene that has mutated multiple times during our evolution. And uh, we have it in other places. In the US, we're getting to see Afro-Latinas get a lot of carriers that they don't know. And in Africa, the greatest burden is in Congo and in Nigeria. But Cameroon also has the privilege to have all the subtypes that we do have, which we don't talk about usually when we talk about sickle cell. There is even a type called the Cameroonese, which nobody talks about when we're talking about different aspects. That's purely a very technical aspect of sickle cell. But I loved your presentation, how you showed us that premarital screening can help us go a long way. Neonatal screening can help us go a long way. Early vaccination and identification, penicillin prophylaxis, education, social determinants of health, transition of care. In the US, we discovered that pediatricians and pediatric oncologists were better in taking care of sickle cell patients than adult oncologists and hematologists. And during that period of transition, there is a big problem. Even a lot of internists do not understand sickle cell. Primary because it has been a a disease of childhood and a lot of them didn't go into their adulthood and this has led to resentment among family care doctors and internees so that is why ash which is a society i strongly hold i'm part of it as a certified american hematologist we have put a strong emphasis on training family doctors and internees on understanding and ed physicians on taking care of because those are all models we can use back at home I'm never going to rely on my uh, flight for the pharmaceutical company to try to make all these drugs available. I'm a physician in the first place and I love these drugs to be available at home, to be av available, affordable and cheap. And we should also train our doctors back home to be able to use them effectively. And uh, so Elvis, this is really my take. APEC, I would love to know more about APEC and what they're doing. I would love for us to also improve transfusional medicine back home, which is a big problem. And uh, we'd love to see what we can do as a group in order to improve it. I'd like to end this by thanking Dr. Yauba, who has been a wonderful advocate for sickle cell recently. Yauba, for those who don't know, has uh, been involved in advocacy, making sure that the ministry actually revamps its... its uh, it's department where they have to deal with sickle cell, re get the guidelines, republish the guidelines and make them available. And he has also been involved in writing a principal fundamental action paper, which is going to influence how sickle cell is taken care of in Cameroon. So it's a, he's a wonderful leader. So I would just love to acknowledge him and also thank Sandrine for all what she's doing. So thank you, Elvis. It's a wonderful topic to discuss. Very wonderful topic to discuss, especially when we think that more than 500,000 people are carriers of sickle cell in Cameroon. That's a very, uh, Cameroon is one of those countries with a very high endemicity for sickle cell. So it's a very important topic. I see Professor Bobby is on his camera. I would like to hear from you, Prof. And thanks for always taking time to join us on the town hall. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for asking me to say a word. I'm always impressed. And I want to thank all of you for the excellent sessions you've had. And I've been very impressed with the ones I've listened to. And the one today was not, not every different. I like the holistic approach that my colleague has presented. But the other comment I'm going to make is that it's a small world. Dr. Sandrine Polo, did you find my name at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati? <laughs> yes. No, you did? Yeah. OK, because. Um, Marilyn Gaston and I started the Sickle Cell Center at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, 1972. And I was the vice president of the Sickle Cell Awareness Group because the main thing we did was what you're talking about now, pre-screening, premarital screening, because we figured there was no cure but prevention. And then that was followed by what we call genetic counseling. And I, I'm not going to say anything because you've said a lot about that. But I'm just so impressed to see you coming in 35, 40 years after I left Cincinnati and still carrying out good work. 
that was my biggest contribution when I was there, getting involved in sickle cell. And I had really intended to go into hematology because I have SCSD trait. That's a type of sickle cell disease. It's not as severe as SS. But in the beginning, I thought I had SS. So I knew I was going to be dead before 30. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons I went back to Cameroon in 1973 to get my whole family tested. And when I came back, we had electrophoresis. And that's when they told me, no, Dr. Kobe, you don't have SS. You have SD. It's a milder form. And then I had hopes. But I've, I have quite a few family members who have the disease. There are some who are now adults because of the preventive care that you talk about, the holistic care that you talk about, and those who can afford to get the hydroxyurea. So thank you very much for an excellent presentation and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you all very much for asking me to say a word, but I was just impressed when I said, oh, Cincinnati, that's my hometown. Yeah, it's, 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 it's been mine for a long time too. <laughs> I no, see that. I see true. that. When I, I left and went on, on my other uh, screen to look at your profile and what you did in Cincinnati when you got there trained and then stayed there for a while from 2011, I think, to, to 2018. Good. Thank you. Quite a small world, and that's one of the beauty about the town hall. We come here not just to meet and talk about healthcare, but also to connect and discover each other and build collaboration across the different areas of work that we do. So thank you very much, Prof. You always have uh, taken time to join us, and that gives us, you can't imagine the encouragement we, we get when we see you attend the town hall. It's really a big encouragement to all of us and to all the other healthcare professionals around the world. And to remind you all, the town hall is already having about 2,300 uh, healthcare professionals from Cameroon who have attended at least one session out of the 103 session we've had from about 35 countries. That's just to give you the reach of the town hall. And if you missed uh, uh, Dr. Matt's uh, presentation, we always make sure we download all this uh, record, recorded version of this presentation and host it on our YouTube channel. It's a very great repository. If you visit the YouTube channel of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals, you will get all the topics that we've covered since we started the Cameroon Town Hall. And uh, you can really, really find it a very important uh, repository that can give you so much knowledge on the different disease that has been covered in the Town Hall. So this is the time we'll be uh, taking questions from the audience. If you have any specific questions for uh, uh, Matt Sandrine, you can ask. Uh, but I think if I go into the comments, uh, someone asked a question to Matt. And uh, I think... Uh, this question came from Mattel Jouvet, who wanted to know if uh, you could just say some few words on the, the prevention approach to sickle cell at the individual and community levels, besides its care. Okay, besides the care. So I think at the individual level, um, we've covered already the early medical visit. It's really important. Uh, one thing that the association, parent association and mentioned APED does is actually checking the uh, weather advisory and then uh, advise their members to hydrate when it's uh, very hot in Yaoundé and also when you have a lot of uh, wind because you can see people with a uh, long issue with asthma can have exacerbation. So I think hydration at the individual level and uh, also making sure that you always check the weather so you are well prepared to go outside. And or I think it's been also shown in the literature that um, patient with low uh, nutritional status also tend to be more anemic. So making sure you get all the vitamins from food. Um, and these are all the questions we get also in, in with patients. I have one of my colleagues here, Dr. Yanda. She's the one uh, supporting, she's a, a pediatrician supporting the Sickle Cell Association in Cameroon, and she's now in Canada. And that's one thing that she always says, hydration. Uh, make sure you know also your triggers, uh, because it depends from one patient to the other. It might be cold, it might be some food, which uh, trigger your crisis. Uh, comfort. So that's what I can say at the individual level. I don't know if other uh, wants to add. At the community levels, um, some people have mentioned the counseling uh, for couples. 
it's interesting because I was um, I was reading about it uh, while preparing this presentation, and it seems to be different attitudes, at least in Cameroon, Ghana, and Nigeria, countries with the high burden of sickle cell disease. You will see that people who are ready to get married have, um, and we say, more reservations with um, um, premarital screening. However, they tend to uh, see uh, prenatal screening as a solution because they've already sort of um, decided on their wedding plans. <laughs> so I think if we think about the co at the community levels, we should actually go back to high school. I think we have to go really back, even elementary school. We can parallel this to uh, HIV prevention. This can probably give a sense of uh, emergency or uh, sort of, uh, so, so people can see this is really serious. And the, um, about the prenatal, uh, premarital screening, one thing I wanted to add is there is a lot of stigma for couples who found out after they got married. So I would imagine also that if people decide to carry on with their wedding plans, knowing or the family knowing that they are carriers, uh, there might be some stigma associated to that decision. So I think at the community level, it's awareness. I would say also empathy toward those couples because these are not uh, life decisions to make um, when it comes to deciding to part with your your loved one. So that, That's very true, Matt. And we've had a session here in the previous session when Dr. Yaba presented where, you know, one of our participants outrightly said it is not right to advise people not to get married just because uh, of their uh, sickle cell uh, status because they are carriers. And that was from an emotional standpoint. And I agree with you when you say, how can we, should we should be able to carry this conversation some way back to high school. So people actually get to that point of awareness where even before thinking about getting married, that should be some of the things that they should consider and not when they are coming to sign with the mayor or not when they are already coming for you to bless their marriage and then you are putting that as a requirement or asking them to go to the test. And then obviously there will be some resistance because as you said, Matt, these are not easy decisions to make. They are very difficult decisions to make because it has to do with emotions and it has to do with something very uh, uh, difficult to understand as love. And I would like to get uh, Dr. Yaoba and then I get back to Dr. F uh, to Professor Forby. Dr. Yaoba, I saw your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Just two points. I think one, uh, the first one is actually connected to what uh, Matt was saying about the need to reinforce uh, um, sensitization and counseling, particularly uh, within schools. Uh, within schools, I think uh, many governments do have adolescent healthcare programs and uh, that are being uh, rolled out in schools. But uh, unfortunately, I think not sufficient attention is given uh, to um, the conditions like sickle cell. I think we have had a missed opportunity, particularly, um, particularly um, failing to like seize the opportunity that um, other programs like HIV, uh, HIV adolescent health programs, uh, um, had to offer to actually introduce this kind, this concept of um, awareness about um, sickle cell threat in 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 secondary schools and also in primary schools. I think there was a lot of funding. Uh, going to uh, towards that, uh, sensitizing people about their uh, HIV status, but uh, more importantly, more, more importantly, I think that if we we actually feel or we actually did not see that opportunity to integrate uh, the need uh, to raise sickle cell awareness, because that could have been like a low hanging fruit. And then, in, uh, in secondly, I think I still at the community level, I think I also see the opportunity of actually. Um, actually engaging uh, other groups uh, like, uh, I don't know, women's group, uh, maybe uh, other pair groups, and even at the level of the household. So parents start educating their children early on about uh, sickle cell. And I think uh, what would be important in this area is really to get some educational material that could be shared maybe through uh, social media to sensitize parents. And um, then the, the question I had, I think, this actually connected to one of the uh, one of the slides that uh, Dr. Matt presented during the global distribution of um, sickle cell 
uh, and also sickle, uh, sickle, cell, sickle cell disease and the threat uh, across the globe. And I think uh, what is evident is that the world population is going to increase. I think there are a projection suggesting that uh, by 2045 and 2050, the world will hit about uh, 10 billion. And actually, two, um, 2 billion of the 10 billion will be residing in sub-Saharan Africa. So Africa will become like the most populous uh, uh, continent by 2045, 2050 or so. And uh, if we look at the trends again, we will realize that at, but the, the, the rate of migration will also increase. So you'll be getting more uh, people from sub-Saharan Africa in the United, in North America, in South in Southeast Asia, and also um, uh, Europe. So if nothing is being done to actually reinforce these uh, measures, preventive measures, then we should actually anticipate that uh, we will see an increase in the number of um, uh, patients uh, or children born with sickle cell uh, across the globe as um, as we move towards uh, 2050 or so. And I think, uh, I don't know who can do this, but I think it would be nice to maybe see whether we can, some models or mathematicians can actually like develop some sort of uh, scenarios, models and prediction uh, so that we can actually uh, use those papers or those models uh, for advocacy that this is where we are heading to if we don't act. If we act, this is how the trend will look like. So that is a uh, one one contribution I wanted to add. Um, when I remembered about this look in the slide that um, Dr. Matt presented, and uh, thinking forward, over. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Yaba. And uh, quite important if we have such a, a simulation with such a projection to show where we can be if we do nothing and where we will be if we do something. That could really be easier to use to show politicians to get some of engagement in the fight against sickle cell. I'll, I'll thank you very much for your contribution, and I will pass it over to Professor Fabi for uh, the comments you you wanted to make. So yeah, no. I think he has some questions for our speaker, but I just want to reiterate the point of pre-marital counseling. Uh, I did quite a bit of it within my own family. And uh, one case at least was very difficult. We ended up in them not getting married and they discussed it among themselves. And back in 1973, we figured the only way to really eradicate this problem is by counseling. Educating the kids, education, and then counseling the couples. Because at that time, we did not have any of these genetic things we're talking about now, and even when we have it, it's too expensive. I know it's an emotional issue, but I can tell you from a first-hand experience, and some of you have done more than I did, the four years I was involved with the disease, and seeing how the patients came in in crisis, and how many times they got hospitalized, what an emotional and financial drain was to the family. I think the emotional drain of not getting married to the boy you wanted to marry because you found out he had the trade and you have the trade is less than what you go through if you end up with a child with sickle cell disease. I'm telling you honestly, uh, it took a lot of time. In the 70s, the average time in the hospital was four months out of a year, which was one third of their lives in the hospital. Wow. And then at that time, the average lifespan was more like 16 and 17 years in the United States. And I know in Cameroon, much less, so I know Mangu started bringing more awareness. So I think that idea of counseling, if you cannot do it all over, please talk to your family members. And prevention is always better than cure. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. And uh, that's really a, a, a great example you cited here. If you can watch the suffering of a child with sickle cell, then making that decision will be easy um, uh, for you. So that's we keep, we have to continuously uh, educate the community. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to get uh, some more last rounds of questions while we 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 wrap up uh, the session. Let me know if you have any other question for uh, Dr. Matt. Uh, Sandri? Yeah. Elvis, I wanted to follow up with, uh, I don't know if Sandrine has any comments about the modeling 
aspects like modeling in SQL Cell going forward is a very important thing for us to do because a lot of things have shifted. It's just This is just for us to talk about general reflections. We know the gene that actually leads to sickle cell has the propensity to mutate. Over thousands of years, we've known that. More than many other genes. So that loci itself is a very weak loci that tends to mutate over time. And its mutation and the survivor, when you use the hiding Weinberg equation, you realize that that area, every recessive gene is supposed to die out unless there is something actually pushing it in order for that gene to survive because it's a recessive gene. And in sickle cell, it has always been malaria. And once we're dealing with malaria, if you look at the trend of all hemoglobinopathies, they are found in malaria endemic areas because the plasmodium falciparum in itself and the different plasmodia love normal red blood cells. They didn't love any red blood cell, which is in itself not deficient in any way. So with malaria elimination programs going on and uh, with us getting better in keeping these patients alive, with us also getting better in, in the kind of technology we're using and also in the social determinants of health, the pool, it's going to be a very fascinating analysis to really do because sickle cell did not only occur, it's not only an African problem, but it stayed in the tropics because of fas fasciparum. So it did stay in the tropics because of fasciparum. Even when you look across Africa, the burden is different across Africa in different places of Africa. You see it more in the tropics, which you can also see across the globe because everywhere the equator passes, there is sickle cell. That's why there is sickle cell in India. There is a lot of sickle cell, even when you go up in the Mediterranean, some of part of Spain and uh, Portugal, they do have it. In all the Arabia countries, they have it. But when it comes to how the sickle cell interacted with other genes, which has led to therapeutics, as Sandrine did propose, what we're doing now, what we call gene editing with CRISPR technology and the lentivirus, we're using the aspect that some mutations were closer to the hemoglobin F, so they do produce more hemoglobin F. But this analysis, this modeling, it will be a fascinating thing to do in order to see how the trend is going to look like. The results may not be as bad as we think, but it's going to be amazing to get to do that analysis. That's just one thing I wanted to add when uh, Yauba did propose about the modeling aspect. But this is a very, if there is one career, I usually talk about it jokingly, if you're interested in hematology and you want to make one career your goal, it should be sickle cell. We're getting a lot of improvements in transplant. We never used to transplant sickle cell patients after the age of 15 years. There is a lot going on in the NIH, which has led to real development because these patients are getting to adulthood with little side effects, so we are transplanting them. This is super expensive. Gene editing technology needs to be made cheaper because those are ways of curing them. We have multiple cohorts, and I have a patient who got gene editing during the clinical trials that were published, amazingly doing well. Those are things that you could not hear of, amazingly doing well. And uh, we do have all these medications, but there are more than 10 other medications in the pipeline. I will tell you that because I was involved in about two of the clinical trials when I was in New York, there are about 10 other medications because in the past 10 years, we got to better understand the systemic aspect of sickle cell and what is truly happening in the, in the pathological aspect. But as I said before, how this improves mortality is always very little because the things Sandrine insisted on today are the things that drive mortality the most. So in the individual aspect, what I wanted to add is things like Early administration of prophylaxis with penicillin is important for those patients, which is not a routine practice in Cameroon. Making sure that vaccination is done as per the PEP and they do catch up vaccines, which is not paid for in the Cameroon uh, vaccination program. And if we can integrate special groups to get catch up vaccines, once they get vaccines, you don't just stop there. You have to be able to do catch up vaccines for those patients, especially those who have encapsulated bacteria because they have functional asplenia. So these are all things that would we'll get into education, 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 social determinants of health, transition of care, very big. So thank you, Elvis.
Yeah, th thank you, Mono. And uh, I think we heard from uh, the example that uh, uh, Sandrine mentioned, uh, comparing the Jamaican uh, 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 situation with the one in the US, we could see the impact of uh, following up care and, uh, you know, those who took the step to go to the community to remind those who missed their visit to come for their visit or to just go check what was happening with them, all those kinds of contact tracing of the cases and uh, making sure they have uh, routine care really led to a great improvement in mortality. So these are really those personal actions that could really help. Uh, we have the uh, Dr. Kate who has a comment still. Hi, Dr. Kate. Yeah, Elvis, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, sure. All right, great. So I just wanted to come back to what our prof was saying and uh, about uh, screening. And I don't have the data at hand, but it seems uh, that even when couples have decided to go on with um, getting married, it seems the rate of divorce among those couples seems to be higher because, of course, the burden of... Um, of the disease, especially when they now have kids with with sickle cell, so if that if that is presented when making a case at counseling, I think it can help deter. As you said, emotions are are, are usually involved. Um, emotions are not rock solid; they are wavery. So when things are well explained and uh, people tend to cut, see that they can make the right the right decision and my second comment or question i think mono alluded to uh slightly around um i, I think basically just for knowledge purpose because we know in our setting in cameroon in Medellin, it, it's impossible to have these new techniques um as of now uh, but you know lots of um gene therapies or gene technologies are the the price tend to fall rapidly. So I just wanted to maybe prop uh, Dr. Polo or, or maybe Moon or what they think about how rapidly those technologies, uh, those prices may fall and how these things may become available in, in Cameroon or in other African settings. I uh, would like to hear that from Dr. Sandin and please don't say it is when Jesus will come. Uh, well, it's close, it's close to that. If we think about gene therapy, uh, it, it's new. It's from last year, just been approved by FDA. It's not even been a year. And even in the US, they are, they are struggling with how they're gonna pay for it. Uh, actually, there has been a presidential executive order from President Biden early this year with a mandate to find a way to pay for cell-based gene therapy. So the idea is they will negotiate pricing with the manufacturer, if we can call it manufacturer, it's not a drug, but, uh, and, and then uh, states could actually uh, distribute this, uh, make it available for the patient at one condition, they have to follow up health outcomes. So the, the federal government will pay for it, negotiate pricing, but the state, if they decide to actually sign the contract with the manufacturer at the negotiated price, they have to report and follow up on health outcomes. And these new therapies, the, the, the FDA has mandated a follow-up of 15 years. I don't foresee those therapies to come to Cameroon because we are struggling with basic things like blood transfusion. Transfusional medicine is not effective. So if you have a patient receiving gene therapy or any cell-based therapy, you have to follow up at least if we, we follow the guidelines from the FDA to follow up uh, with them for 15 years. So we don't have the setup of this kind of uh, cell-based therapy, not even thinking about gene therapy per se. So I, I foresee that not before 15 years, when the setup is well established in the US. And if you look at the, um, I presented a slide uh, showing the market share of those therapy. And the market share is very US based because they anticipate that by 2030 is only the US is gonna drive the, this market share, not the rest of the world, not even Europe. So I, I don't want to pop the bubble here, but 
I think we still have things in our hands. We have hydroxyurea, although 25% of those patients sometimes do not respond, but we have that. We have other interventions as well. And we also have L-glutamine. I haven't mentioned about it, but it's actually also uh, cheaper, actually, than the, uh, the hydroxyurea, although not as effective in preventing uh, pain crisis, but still a good modality. Um, so I think we wanted to, that's probably, that's my parting word if we are at the closing time, is we, we have to step back and think that we need to swallow that pill because we are looking at quick ways, get rid of the disease, understand premarital counseling. But if we think about cystic fibrosis, it's also a monogenetic disorder, but they don't talk about premarital counseling. They, they have other ways. I'm not against premarital counseling, uh, full disclosure, but I'm just saying we have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of tools in our hands and if we have to go to the premarital counseling route, we need to probably look at who is best place to talk to those um, soon to be wedded couples. Is it someone who is uh, with other disease? Is it a couple, a divorced couple? Is it, I think those, we have to really look at that very carefully. And I'm glad that uh, Professor Matthias actually mentioned that he did that within his family. These are simple tools within our reach uh, so I'm afraid that we, we need to swallow that pill, educating, uh, taking those baby steps and uh, before those therapies becomes available because they are not even affordable for people in the US, uh, let alone Canada, the country next door. Thank you, Matt. I agree with you. Let's make ma the malaria uh, medication that costs less than 5,000 available to those in the interior villages before even thinking about gene therapy. The so, basic thing we can do should be done. We don't yet have even malaria uh, medications in all the parts of the country. So the basic things need to be done. Talk less of an efficient blood transfusion system, as you mentioned. So Dr. Yaba, uh, a comment from you. Elvis, before... I want to be a little bit of a devil's advocate. A little bit different from all of that, not because I want to differ, just that I want to be a devil's advocate. I think it's all about a platform. So why do I say it's all about a platform? In order for us to be able to do gene therapy, we need a platform. And that platform is going to address multiple diseases. I'm an oncologist and we are getting into gene therapy. We cannot avoid that. Meaning that we're going to use genetics in order to cure multiple cancers. We're going to use the same technology. If you're able to do a bone marrow transplant and get to that aspect, then you're very close. I would say that. So I will not go into the details here, but I'm a very big optimistic person. And I believe that with time, time drive, the way technology has been advancing, Brian is going to tell you that human uh -huh. genome that we use to sequence in for years, we are able to sequence that in weeks. When I sequence cancers, they are more than 20 times more than the human genomic pool. And we can do that in weeks. And the technology is getting smaller and it's getting portable. My goal and my drive is that Africans should not stop dreaming, but we should be able to get ourselves invested in a technology that is going to improve multiple things in a platform. If we can get ourselves, I know it's going to be difficult, as Dr. Polo said, but things will improve as technology goes by. Things that we used to do for 10 years, we'll be able to do in a day because of improvement in other aspects of technology that will bring things together. So I'm just being a devil's advocate in the sense that I want us to still keep dreaming. And I want us that if we develop that platform, we may get this in a few years, but that's not the way to actually solve the problem. The way to solve the problem still goes back to what Dr. Polo told us, determinants of health and improving all those aspects. But still, I'm a, I'm, we'll talk about this out of the, the session, but I'm a very positive person. And I think building this platform is important. Thank you, Dr. Mono. I like your optimism, especially when you say things will continue to change rapidly and uh, change is coming in so many ways in Cameroon as well. Dr. Yauba Seidu, we need your, your comments. Thank you very much. I just wanted to follow up on one of the comments that uh, 
Professor uh, Phoebe mentioned about um, uh, the amount of time a sickle cell patient pa um, passes in the hospital per year. So I think I think that uh, he stated about maybe four months in the US or so. But I think that is really like a call for concern. And uh, the real problem here is that why we have a lot of data when it comes to the when it comes to pathophysiology and perhaps epidemiology, there are certain aspects that are very critical for decision making that we tend to lack data. So for instance, um, the psychological aspect for of sickle cell, because uh, we talked about decision making and most decision makings are based on emotions. So how do we get the uh, psychologists to like study the sufferings of those patients, of, of those uh, families, uh, and then to synthesize that into actionable uh, information that people can use. So that is what that is one question. The second one is um, health economics data. How much money do patients spend to cure sickle uh, to in short, how many how much money do uh, parents or households spend to take care of a uh, sickle cell patient? Be it in the US, I think the US data may be available, but I don't think a uh, some sort of systematic analysis has uh, has been done. So what's still in our own context in Africa and maybe Southeast Asia, those important data that are actually lacking. So the point, the question here is, I know uh, someone like the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences in Boya is like an active member uh, of the hall. Is it possible for maybe the town hall to think about how to like um, raise uh, important questions, policy questions, which uh, students can take as part of their uh, MD thesis, part of their uh, MPH thesis, and part of their doctoral thesis, and we can support with the design. And uh, if need be, we can see how we can support the students financially because collecting data in Cameroon in the first place is not uh, is not expensive. So those are some of the thoughts that I have. We really need to ensure that we have the data from all the angles, not only on the or not only on epidemiology or genetics but also the other social determinants of, of health. Over. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. You have a very important uh, contribution there. Uh, we would continue to uh, 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 be a think tank, especially for uh, universities back home in just a lot of topics uh, for research have come out of the town hall. And we have actually had students who have actually uh, told us that they got, their, they got interested in their topic after attending a town hall session. But just putting some of these really interesting topics and sharing with uh, Professor Halle, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences in Boya, could be a great uh, step towards just uh, making those topics available to the students who could be interested in these uh, areas of, uh, of, of their work. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the top of the hour uh, for today. I will just take a, a last round to get some few words with the co-moderators before we end the session. So I'll start with uh, Dr. Brian Tegomo. Brian, some last words from you, please. Thanks, thanks, Elvis. I, I think those are a really insightful uh, discussion. I certainly learned learned a lot. I um I I really I love the ideas that uh, Dr. Yauva uh, shared. Um, and I think that that's kind of, uh, will be really important. Um, I I do know some modelers, particularly working infectious disease modeling and and uh, mostly in malaria. But I I, I think the idea of uh, develop you know at least building um some quantitative models uh to 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 simulate where the uh, uh where the this this uh this potential trend essentially uh as uh, as this moves on uh, population growth and migration as dr yauba mentioned during his uh discussions around the importance of these would be very useful for stakeholders and and also uh advocates so i i think um if we and it was really great, Dr. Mona, if you can mobilize uh, Professor Halley, who was here last week, uh, last session for the discussion, maybe to have one or two uh, students, maybe from, from, the, from the university, from the Faculty of Health Sciences, who might be interested in maybe working with us. We can always help to connect them with people who do this kind of modeling kind of work, so we can maybe build some, some, some models that can help uh, define the, the trajectory or, or projections um, um, of this of this disease burden as we as we move on. I think this will really help to 
uh, strengthen the case for increased uh, prioritization and resource allocation for uh, for prevention uh, programs uh, moving forward. So uh, really looking forward to that. I think that's something that I think we can discuss about offline and, and possibly uh, see how we can uh, engage Professor Hale, um maybe with a few students who can be interested in building this moving forward. Um, thanks a lot, Elvis. I think this was really insightful. I learned a lot. Um, over to you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, as we mentioned, sickle cell is a very important topic to the town hall. And if there is any area that the town hall will be ready to offer scholarship to students doing their research, that will be sickle cell, an opportunity for the students to take off uh, as soon as we engage with uh, Professor Halle. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll get to Dr. Kate for your last words. I really just want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Polo for her presentation and um, her responses to the questions. And one thing I just want to add, in, in public health, I think one of the cheapest uh, prevention strategies we have is education. And I myself am a carrier of the sickle cell trait. How did I find out uh, about sickle cell disease. I was a young teenager. I was reading my dad's Bible. And in the Bible, he had written that this brother, this brother, this brother have a trait AS. They should not get married to a woman with AS. So that triggered the interest. And I took the Bible to my mom and like, what is AS? And then she explained to me, I think I was about 12 or 18 years old at the time. And yeah, so that's how I got to know about sickle cell. How did I know I was a carrier? I think that was uh, probably fourth year in medical school when I went for the test myself. And yeah, so that really just shows how education probably within that familial setting can be important. And so if we continue these discussions, not only in the town hall, but out of the town hall, in the churches, in associations, get, you know, civil, civil society organizations and advocacy organizations continue these discussions within the community. I get that the critical mass of our population will get to know about the disease and know about how, uh, know ways in which we can prevent the disease. And this will all contribute towards the elimination of sickle cell. Thank you, Elvis. Thank you very much, Dr. Kate, and thank you for sharing that interesting and very important story that adds to the importance of uh, education. Uh, before we get to the chair for his conclusion, let me get our presenter, Dr. Matt Sandrin, for some last words to the audience. Thank you, Elvis. I'm just going to end with this, um, piggyback on what the previous speaker said. Education is the key. I learned a lot uh, preparing this talk, so I thank you for actually uh, Dr. Mono suggesting, uh, to inviting me actually to this session. So what I'm gonna say is about the platform. Yes, we need to build the platform and they are platform which exists in Africa today. I'm thinking about the uh, platform used to combat HIV. I think some of those resources are still in place. Uh, in Cameroon, HIV care is subsidized. Why don't we leverage the same resources to actually advocate for premarital screening, for um, screening for the newborn screening, because those patients with HIV have family. They may not have HIV. But there has been a huge effort to combat HIV across Africa. So that's one thing. Uh, and the second thing is uh, Africa has the highest burden. So it, this should be an African response to this, not a Cameroonian response, a Ghanaian or a Nigerian response. I can tell you that uh, even penicillin, basic thing as penicillin, are stock out in Yaoundé. And I was reading uh, articles on Tanzania, on Kenya, stock out. So why don't we get back to the basic, like our African leaders, or even uh, having a multi-country program integrating with uh, international backing. And again, I'm going back to programs like the supporting the um, elimination of HIV because they exist today. And how can we make sure that basic things like uh, prophylaxis are available in our country 
not for Cameroon, but for the entire uh, African country affected by this. And I think it's possible penicillin is not hard to make or it, like in the laboratory, it's Indians are making it. We can do it too. So I invite everyone, the pharmacist in the room, the uh, ventures, the entrepreneurs. This is something uh, within, I think, our reach. So, and the last piece I will say is concerning the siblings. We've talked a lot about the patients. One thing I heard when speaking with families and patient association is that the siblings are actually bearing a, a lot. There are reports of aggressivity towards the sickle cell disease affected child because they're taking a lot of attention. And I have a, uh, one of my good friends who's attending this session has reported also that sometimes even the patient feels there is a burden, they want you just die because they feel they inflict a major, um, ma major loss in terms of economic loss, in terms of family time loss to the siblings. So somebody has mentioned to do some research around those other aspects of care. I think the siblings, we need to also address that. I don't know how exactly, but I think we can start from the patient and extend the care also to the siblings. So those are my parting words, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, not the siblings and even the friends. I had a friend in secondary school who was sickle cell and I can imagine uh, being in the dormitory and all the time we had to rush him to the hospital as his classmates and friends. And it was an extended burden even to the community and also I agree that we really need a study that studies that would come up with data on date disability life years that are lost by these who those who are suffering from a sickle cell disease and all the suffering are surrounding this disease. So thank you very much, Dr. Matt, for your time and for accepting our invitation to speak on this very important topic to the town hall. At uh, this point in time, I'll call on our chair, Dr. Muno, and first thank you very much for your leadership and for always uh, making sure that we have the best of uh, experts to the town hall. Uh, some last words from you before we wrap up. And please, uh, before Dr. Muno, we agreed during the celebration of our 100th anniversary that uh, we're going to do a survey uh, to get the feedback from all the town hall participants on the things that you think we've been doing well and the things that you think we could do better. And this survey is very important to us because it will inform us on just how we can better uh, uh, make this platform that which will continue to educate and inform healthcare professionals in Cameroon and abroad. So the link is on the chat. Uh, Dr. Brian has shared the link once more. If you have not yet completed the survey, please do so. We shared an email through the MailChimp that came to all of you. And we hope if you didn't receive the email, please check in your spam and make sure that you are able to uh, go through the questionnaire. I mean, the survey, it's very easy, just five pages, just easy, basic questions. You just select, read, and select the right response that correspond to what you think is right or wrong about the town hall. And then uh, we will be able to analyze the data and uh, that will help us improve on just the way the town hall is. This is three years since we started. We didn't know this is where we we're going to be, but I think uh, it's just an indication that the work we are doing is important and we'll continue to do so. So thank you, Brian, for uh, sharing the survey on the screen and just showing how easy it is for us to, to complete this survey. So over to you, Dr. Mono. Well, Elvis, thank you very much. And uh, there would have been no one other than Dr. Polo to get us to this point to celebrate World Sickle Cell Day. As you have said, you cannot overemphasize how important sickle cell is to us. I always start my reflection with, if people know what the word Obanje really means, it's a Nigerian word that was coined in the 16th century. It means the child who comes and goes. That was a description of sickle cell in West Africa, the child who comes and goes. When I was young, my, grand, my great grandmother used to tell me she was so beautiful that her brothers, this is how much sickle cell can cause problems. Her brothers were so jealous of her that each time she gave birth to a child, they killed the child. So you can imagine the amount of family free that existed and still exists today because of that what she told me. And that's what has been existing. That had caused her a lot of constraint with her brothers because she thought her brothers killed her children. 
when I got to medical school, myself and my elder sister, we found it was simple. She was AS and her husband was AS and she had SS children who died. And that was the problem because my family is full of sickle cells, my maternal family. This just got to explain to me what sickle cell does in a nutshell. And I became interested in the disease. That's what led me to get into clinical pathology because I thought initially in Cameroon, it was being managed by the hematopathologists. When I moved over to the US, I went into pathology for the same reason I went into hemato-oncology. It's a very dear disease to me. I've seen the ramifications of sickle cell among my cousins, among my immediate family members, those who after counseling still got married, and what it causes after having a first child, which you think is a game of choice, having sickle cell and what happens to the marriage going forward. It's been devastating. Now, solutions. Sandrine did propose all of them. I don't think the solutions are what we propose in the hospital, which are therapeutics. I think premarital screening is an important aspect. How we do it is how we are going to adopt on how best to do it. I'm not an expert in that. Newborn screening is something that should be done right now in all places in Cameroon. We should be able to know. Early penicillin availability is something that should be available. Vaccination, we should prolong the PEV and be able to get these children get extended vaccines. Health education is important. Social determinants of health and integrating the community is important. Transition of care, even in Cameroon, is a big problem. Pediatricians are so good that once they move over to adult medicine, few or any adult medicine really knows how to take care of sickle cell. From my education and my research in Cameroon, few. And once you evaluate these patients and if they're on the appropriate treatment, you find out that less than 5% of doctors know how to prescribe hydroxyurea, even know how to prescribe it and dose of ment. That has been my experience back home. So I think we can never stop talking about sickle cell. I would love to thank Sandrine for all what she's doing with her organization. She should continue the job. And next time, let her let us know what APEC does better. And also there is Dr. Yauva here, who is a big advocate. And uh, he's the director of the Clinton Initiative, but I think he has taken sickle cell as one of his go-to projects. So I think he should continue. And through him and his connections in the ministry, I think we can get a lot out of this disease at the national level. So please, Dr. Yauba, don't stop advocating for these uh, patients who are suffering. So Elvis, I think those are my last words. I would want to say the, the, the theme for the year is hope through progress, advancing sickle cell globally. It's a global disease. Africa bears the burden. A lot of people are getting attention to it. Let's try as much as possible to make everyone aware. So thank you very much. And thanks for the rest of the moderator. Thanks for your wonderful time. Thank you very much, uh, Chair of the Town Hall. And thanks for your leadership. Uh, for all of you, if we are going to celebrate the uh, World Sickle Cell Day on Wednesday, make it a commitment to do some communication on your WhatsApp status, on your Facebook page, or your Instagram or LinkedIn on sickle cell. And uh, you should emphasize the importance of uh, premarital uh, counseling uh, before uh, getting married, just as what we have agreed is very important to, to in the prevention of uh, sickle cell disease. So once again, thank you so much for joining us for this edition of the Cameroon Town Hall for Healthcare Professionals. We hope to see you again in a fortnight. We hold this session every two weeks, uh, twice a month. If you came in late, we are going to have the session on our YouTube channel and you can watch it to get all the full presentation of uh, Matt Sandrine. And once again, we thank our presenter for accepting our invitation. I wish you a very nice weekend. And if you want to stay back to create some connections and speak on some other issues around sickle cell, we have the parking lot just immediately after this. I wish you a nice weekend, all of you.